Yeah, it, it doesn't follow that that's the case of necessity. Once again, any instant, um, life is available as a choice. And so the mind can make a choice for life. Even at a, an instant of, of seeming death of the body, the mind still, at that instant, could make the choice for life. Um, but, the, but the death of the body as such does not automatically imply that there's going to be eternal life, yes. awakening, heaven, etc. Yes. It's still an interpretation or some attempt, a construct to attempt to explain things. In other words, it's believed, of course, again, that, that birth is real, that life is in the world and constitutes, you know, growing and aging and having experiences and there is like a linear life that one can look back on and even look forward to. And then the death of the body is, is the end of that span of, of life. And still the mind tries to make, uh, make up something in a sense of um, to reassure itself that, that um, even though this was not the most wonderful experience here on, on earth or whatever, that that God is waiting, and as soon as I die, then I'll, you know, go to heaven immediately. And, and some will say everyone goes to heaven. Others will say, you know, everyone is judged, and someone, some go to hell, and some go to heaven. There's all kinds of explanations, reincarnation, and other, you know, keep evolving until you make it back to the source, and so on and so forth. And lifetimes are still seen to be lifetimes of the body. But ultimately, it's still in a sense, a justification for a mind that, that doesn't have a clue of what's going on and would like to believe, you know, that that it just, that's how the dilemma of, of conflict gets resolved. You simply die. The body dies and then the conflict is resolved. But when you really follow that line of thinking out, it's like if, if that were something that had a resonance and a truth to it, then in a sense, you know, why why live in this world? I mean, why continue on? Why not put put the body to death as soon as possible if heaven <laughs> waits with the death of the body? You see, it's kind of a circular reasoning that, that if you really start to look at it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And, um, it's you know, it's part of that just an attempt to explain things. Just as... Um, Mythologies throughout the ages um, in all cultures have attempted to explain the world, have attempted to, to break, make some meaning out of the world. And we have myths of, of gods and goddesses in Greek mythology, and we have myths of, of um, multiple gods in, you know, in Hinduism. And even in uh, the Bible, the Adam and Eve story, you know, is an attempt to explain what happened, that, uh, you know, Eve took a bite out of the tree of good and evil, and then Adam and Eve supposedly were thrown out of the garden for uh, for disobeying God, and that was described as the fall of man, and so on and so forth. And all of these myths and systems have been attempts to uh, explain, give some meaning to uh, this world. When the metaphysics we're talking about is looking into the mind and looking at the the beliefs that made up the illusion of the world without trying to find a source or a meaning in the world. Scientists looking for, with their uh, telescopes now, their electronic telescopes that have super distance range, looking for the Big Bang, looking for evidence of the Big Bang. Still, even from the scientific mythology, so to speak, they're still looking out in the world for the beginning. And there is no beginning. Mm -hmm. It's still a looking at the unexplainable in order to explain it. Yes, yes. And it's obviously there's a belief in the reality of it. That's what. That's why the search for attempting to explain it. One, it, it appears to be real. The world appears to be real because the five senses witness to the reality of it, to a mind that that wishes it to be <laughs> real, that wishes it to, to have a, a, a reality and a, a life of its own. So the fear that we've heard expressed recently by a friend that um, he thought perhaps he would, you know, his body would 
would be dying soon before he had a chance to really follow this path of the Course of Miracles out and really awaken. Um, this doesn't hold any water in this context because the awakening has no relationship, no bearing on the life or death of the body as, as it's defined that way. Mm -hmm. At some level, even at an unconscious level, there, you know, that's where fear comes in. Um, there is a belief in the body, and then, of course, believing the body is is me or is where I'm abiding or in some way is associated with who I am. Then, death of the body, which seems to be an ending or termination, you know, is a is a very fearful idea because it, in a sense, it's like, uh oh. This is the determination of me. Mm -hmm. um, even the the more sophisticated uh, metaphysical systems that that believe that there's something that survives the death of the body, for instance, the soul that goes on. When you really start to take a look at those ideas very closely, you know, it still, in a sense, comes back to well, what is the source of this thing that dies, you know, and why. Does part stay and is, is part split off and go on to something else? I mean, there's still that sense of splitting, or sense of, of duality, and in a sense, from even from a, a deeper reincarnational perspective, it's like, well, it can be a stepping stone to think that that everyone continues to go through quote lifetimes unquote or opportunities to learn lessons, and that in the end, everyone returns to the source. And that can be a very comforting kind of thought. Uh, but the deeper one goes, it, in a sense, it's kind of like, well, these lifetimes do have a lot of um, um, aggravation and uh, suffering and turmoil in them. And um, the, th the question would come up then, what, what kind of God you know, holds out the prize at the end of this long, perhaps, um, journey of many lifetimes to... Um, kind of hold out the prize of the carrot at the end and, and say, you know, you've got to go through this pain and suffering, you know, before you come and reach me. And in a sense, you, in a saying you've got to go through a lot of painful learning before you wake up, when it still connects God with the, the perceptual world, it still, um, you still have a God who, who in some way is connected to this and in some way then is connected to the, the pain or suffering. If he even, in a sense, knows about it, <laughs> you know, in a sense, um, and is deciding, you know, to stay aloof or to stay apart until this and that, then we, you know, get back to, you know, that all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God, you know, who is is not temp tinkering and tampering with the suffering of his children. Not very loving, then. No. I mean, the, the all-loving kind that goes out, and then... Well, if he's all-loving but just has no power to do that, is, that, is out of control, then... Yes. Omnipotence yeah. kind of uh, disappears as an attribute at that point. So, uh, but of course, we do have a metaphor of, um, of the Holy Spirit who sees the illusions in the mind but knows they're not real. But even the Holy Spirit is simply, uh, metaphorically, God's representative or the remembrance of God, that God knows not form. So in, in that sense, uh, it's not like God knows about suffering. God knows what he created and only what he created, and that is spirit and love. At the closing of our discussion of death, um, there's a couple sentences from page 64 again in the teacher's manual um, that are really helpful. And we'll start up with the uh, second to last paragraph. And the last to be overcome will be death. Of course, without the idea of death, there is no world. All dreams will end with this one. This is salvation's final goal, the end of all illusions. 
And then from the bottom of the last paragraph, And what is the end of death? Nothing but this, the realization that the Son of God is guiltless now and forever. Nothing but this, but do not let yourself forget it is not less than this. Well, that brings us right up to the resurrection, which is actually the next thing here in the teacher's manual. Um, let's, let's start by addressing the resurrection of Jesus. That's what usually comes to mind when the word resurrection is spoken. Okay, as, as we began our discussion with death, saying that uh, the common usage of the, the word death involves the death of the body, uh, the resurrection of Jesus or the resurrection of Lazarus is another famous one where we're, it's still talking about, uh, in a sense, a body coming back to life. And we've just kind of gone through that the body isn't, doesn't have birth, isn't born, doesn't die, doesn't get sick, doesn't get well. Appearances to the contrary, you know, to the mind that believes in this, these, these things all seem uh, like they are possible and that they do happen. They seem more than just a screen. But with the resurrection of Jesus, this once again was a tremendous teaching example that taken in the context of his life, his teachings of, you know, on the third day, oh, build the temple again, you know, it would be torn down and built up again, um, just telling um, his, his apostles and telling some of his followers that exactly what would happen. And then going through crucifixion, being defenseless, um, completely in that demonstrating everything that he taught in his life. So Jesus really had no belief in death, in the death of the body. Yes. He knew that he was spirit. He knew he was at the mind level and knew that he was spirit and that the death of the body was literally um, nothing. It was, it was completely insignificant. And basically, our story of crucifixion and resurrection is a great teaching example of the insignificance of the body and the power of the mind. In a sense, a mind that has its will aligned with the Father is knows life, you know, and is um, the manifestation of life. And the, really, the power of that example of, of that Jesus left through his bodily death and resurrection um, has the power that it does because he did not have any belief in death and in the body. Yes, it was just a demonstration to the world. And obviously the world and the deceived mind believe very strongly in, in the, the world as, as, as being life. I mean, it's described, um, as my birth is described as, as life or the regeneration of life or whatever and it's not seen as just a projection that, that there is no life on in the world or of the world it's only the mind which is choosing with the Holy Spirit or the mind that's lined up in the right mind that um, experiences life so um, what we do is we can shift it back to the, the mind level again as we did with death and uh, the first paragraph on uh, page 65 in the teacher's manual on the topic, What is the Resurrection?, goes as follows. Very simply, the resurrection is the overcoming or surmounting of death. It is a reawakening or a rebirth, a change of mind about the meaning of the world. It is the acceptance of the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the world's purpose, the acceptance of the atonement for oneself. It is the end of dreams of misery and the glad awareness of the Holy Spirit's final dream. It is the recognition of the gifts of God. It is the dream in which the body functions perfectly, having no function except communication. It is the lesson in which learning ends, for it is...